Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the second episode of the Fourth and Long Podcast. Of course, I'm your host, Ross Allen, and I'm joined here again by my good buddy, Jalen. Jalen, what's up? How's it going, everyone? All right, so we got, we've had quite a busy last week or two of sports. There's a lot of stuff that went down, huh? <laughs> Lots of stuff that went down, crazy stuff. Cool. Uh, some stuff that just totally destroyed um, what I my predictions from the first episode. And I think <laughs> that's what we're going to get into first. Complete. And of course, that is the giant news of Andrew Luck just retiring out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Where were you when Andrew Luck retired? Uh, I was sitting in my room, you know what I'm saying, laying down on my bed, playing a couple games of Xbox, you know what I'm saying, games mm -hmm. here and back and forth, getting pissed off, as most gamers do. Oh, of course. You know of course. what I'm saying? Didn't feel like shooting any stores up or anything, but, you know, Not got yet. angry as a customer. And then, you know, I called you just to let you know to see what your thoughts on it were. Oh, yeah. I was, uh, you know, I was out at dinner, and then I was watching the uh, – I was watching the Florida and um, Florida, Flor um, where are Miami, they? Miami. Thank you. That game. And then I just saw on red, um, you know, background, not that bottom of the ESPN scroll. Andrew Luck retires. And I was just like, what the shit? I was really confused yeah. when I first saw that. So then I immediately I just whip out Twitter and started looking at what Adam Schefter broke the news. That, that bad boy. Um, yeah, that was... I, I, I don't know. Like, right now, I just was kind of speechless about that because I was I was first confused and shocked. And then mm. I, I thought it was fake at the beginning. I thought it was like a Barry McCockinder scene, one of them guys. <laughs> I, I did, too. When I saw it on Twitter, I thought it was a Barry McCockinder. <laughs> Dude's a legend. <laughs> Not going to lie. I, I think I saw it coming. Really? I saw it coming. I didn't see it coming this early. I didn't see it coming this early at mm -hmm. all. I'm not going to say I saw it coming exactly when it happened. Mm -hmm. But I did think he was going to go about four or five weeks into the season, hurt his leg again, and be like, look, I, I can't do it. I thought I, I, I was I, thinking this might have came from um, maybe another injury besides the one he's going through currently, with which is the, uh, mm -hmm. the calf strain that turned into the ankle problem, right? Yes, the high ankle sprain. Yeah. Um it, it's crazy though that news just really shook up the entire NFL landscape. Uh, yeah, but I feel like that I, shows I, just the reality of football, right? I mean, I I got nothing against Andrew Luck. I totally support his decision because it's he got to go out on his own terms at least. Um, but he made his money. He has a degree from Stanford, so the dude's still mm -hmm. set for life. Um, I liked how the Colts organization handled it. Um, not making. Uh, they did a lot better than what Detroit did when Calvin Johnson retired because um, we, all, we all know Calvin Johnson um, still is mad at the Lions for not giving the rest of his um, contract for at least that season, I think, like a few yeah. million. Um, but the yeah, Colts I honored like Andrew Luck's contract, percent. which was um, – that was a good scene. Yeah. I feel like they did it based off the fact that they think he – maybe in a couple of years he thinks he might return. Yes. He's still young. I feel like they're leaving it open for a return. I feel like the Lions knew Calvin Johnson wasn't coming back. Mm -hmm. And if he did, it wasn't going to be to them. You know, maybe, Andrew Luck, we can get a little Brett Favre action going from him. You know, retire a few times. I, I love it. Come back a few times. I love it. Yeah, it's all down in <laughs> the world. Um, he was up there in the MVP. He's going to be up there in the MVP talks, of, of course. But um, the, organ the Colts organization, I applaud them for how they handled it. But I applaud um, the Colts organization. Well, I don't applaud is the shitty ass Colts fans. Bunch shitty of spoiled Colts. fucks is what they are. Man exactly. you had this quarterback that changed your franchise. Um of course, you know, besides Peyton Manning. And they booed yeah. him off the field. His last time leaving that field was filled with booze from that from that stadium. That's unbelievable, right? And it's even worse because at the moment it was still just rumors. Mm-hmm. He didn't they have booed him off based off of rumors. Yep, and then you then you uh, you see those um, season ticket holders that uh, want their money back because he's not going to be the quarterback anymore. I feel like you didn't pay for Andrew Luck season tickets; you paid for Colt season tickets. If you pay for season tickets, you're not just paying for one player; you're paying to see that team. And I think you have to understand that 
uh, the Broncos fans, you know, shout out to them, you know, Bronco gang, baby. About 75,000 fans, um, they have thousands fighting for season tickets every year, and they haven't had a quarterback worth their shit for four years. Exactly. It's, yeah, um, no, it's, it's kind of shocking. It's terrible. And it shows the lack of confidence they have in their team to just because one player went down, mm-hmm. next man up. And that, they don't believe that the next man up can do anything. Exactly. That kind of leads into the impacts of um, the big impacts of Andrew Luck's retirement. Um, so, of course, Houston is now the division favorite. Without that. Yep. Deshaun Watson. Um, yeah. Uh, that, that Colts team, um, they might pick up a couple more wins now um, because when they play the Colts, the Texans should be able to beat them now. Um, but not only does this now put Houston in a better spot for the division in the playoffs. But I think it also, um, going back to uh, the first podcast when I had my uh, playoff predictions um, with the Browns mm-hmm. and Ravens, Ravens barely winning that division, and the Browns making um, ending up as a seven seed, barely missing the playoffs by one game. I think this now um, totally changes the picture and, and it helps the Browns and Ravens because uh, from the AFC South, um, I had the Colts winning the division and the Texans taking up a wild card spot. But now with the Colts not even going, I don't even think they're going to be, they're probably going to be a few games out of the wild card at best. I'd say seven wins. Seven, nine. That's fair. That's reasonable. Yeah. Um, but this definitely allows, this. I think the Ravens still win the division, but now the Browns are going to be able to, um, able to sneak into that wild card. So uh, yeah. Browns fans should be happy about this. Just excited. <laughs> yeah, um. Totally. That that definitely changes the playoff landscape this in the AFC West. That's what happened in Odell Beckham. Oh yeah, it oh, yeah, and definitely um, <laughs> this retirement definitely uh fucked up my predictions because I saw the Colts going to the AFC Championship game, <laughs> and um now they're not even going to be close to a wild card. So a little di- a little no. off now I think. Going to have to put an asterisk um in the description for the episode now I guess. Guess so. <laughs> Shit, that's gonna look ugly when, uh, when we take a look back at that when the season's over. Yeah, that's a cold take. <laughs> Freezing cold takes, baby. That's Freezing what I do. cold take. It's what I do. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but now with this, it's officially Jacoby versus that's time to shine, baby. What are your thoughts yeah. on him, Jalen? Uh, I feel like he came from that Tom Brady system with Bill Belichick, and mm-hmm. I feel like he is. I feel like he's not there as much as Jimmy Garoppolo was, even though Jimmy Garoppolo throws interception after interception. Mm-hmm. I feel like he's still – my thing is I feel like a lot of Patriots quarterbacks, uh, when they're in that system, they look really good. Like when Jacoby was there, he won two games. When Garoppolo was there, he won two games. And Tom Brady, obviously, they look really good. And I feel like a lot of people look really good in the Patriots system. Um, as an example, Brian Hoyer and Matt Castle, two very below average quarterbacks. Who yeah, yeah really Matt Castle, um, what is it? Twen- when Tom Brady tears his ACL, um, like week one, I believe. Was uh, it 2011? I believe it was 11. It was 10 or 11. It, then, yeah, um, Matt Castle took over for him. And yeah. they still did above average. Which goes exactly. into the argument of why um, Tom Brady isn't the GOAT. Be- and he's close yeah, to the system yeah. quarterback. Because you had Matt Castle, <laughs> who's a backup. I think he might. Is he on the Chiefs? I think he's the Chiefs. No, wait, no. I don't think so. Nah, I, don't I don't think, think he has a team. Exactly. We don't even know where the hell Matt Castle is. Um, But that kind of... That, that, that's, um, not, that's a kind of a compliment to the Patriot system, Belichick system, um, be able to just plug in a quarterback and still be good. But that also is a detriment to Tom Brady because that kind of takes away from um from his I guess greatness. Yeah. But, because there's always gonna be that argument that it was his system that he was in that gave it to him. Exactly. But you know Jacoby but, he's uh, he's He's a good quarterback. He's like, a above average backup. So, he, yeah, I feel like Jacoby, while he was there, he wasn't there for that long. So I feel like it actually gives him an advantage because he's still a little bit of himself. Mm-hmm. He's not a Tom Brady replica. Yeah, he's um, still coach. 
Brissette. So I feel like that gives a better chance to su succeed in this new system. Yep. Uh, Brissette brings a little more athleticism to that offense. Um, he's he's definitely a little more mobile than uh, Andrew Luck. But, Andrew Luck was just tough. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, all the credit to him. Um, Andrew Luck went through a shit ton. He played multiple years without any sort of off offensive line in front of him, and he got fucked up a lot of times. Fuck. Yeah, but um, we'll see how Jacoby does. I don't. Um, I saw a lot of people not too high on him. They think he's just not good. I think he's. A, I think he could be above average, but um, he has weapons around him. Um, I he think he's a man in seven quarterback. Mm-hmm. Exactly, but um, this might put a hinder on a lot of fantasy football players out there because, of course, uh, you got you got to feel for the uh. You got to feel for the fans. I saw this all over Twitter when it happened. All the people that just drafted Andrew Luck or recently drafted Andrew Luck. Um, OJ Simpson. <laughs> yeah, it, every <laughs> you guys, you need to check out OJ Simpson's uh, Twitter video on Andrew Luck. It's uh, it's probably one of the better things he does. He's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> besides you know killing a couple people get, and getting away with it he was pretty good at that but um hypothetically so is Ray Lewis Hypothet uh, allegedly <laughs> allegedly okay <laughs> but yeah but now with fantasy um I was high on Eric Ebron but now uh his draft stock definitely dwindles um I think this, but I think a positive. If you if you are a, a fantasy owner of Marlon Mack, the Colts starting running back, this is just going to be better for you because I think they're going to have to rely on him a lot more, going to rely on that run game, than um, use him as a good check down for um, for jo Jacoby Brissett while still getting adjusted and becoming a better quarterback. I think instead of Marlon Mack. I feel like the person who gets the most out of this is Hines, the back of running back. Oh, okay. He's a way better back than Marlon Mack. Okay. I feel like he gets a couple more checkdowns and he gets used out of elusiveness. I feel like he gets in for a couple more scores. I feel like he'll be a good second flex. Okay. okay. I dig it. I dig it. Um, what I was able to do is, um, so I drafted Tyler Eifert late is a good backup uh, tight end. I, maybe not good. That's a stretch of the word. But as a backup tight end, I got Travis. I was able to pick up Travis Kelsey. So hopefully I'm good with the starter. But um, <laughs> then uh, I saw you know Eric Ebron hit the uh, waiver wire, and I I had to pick him up. He's he's still a solid. If you need um, a tight end still on solid. the bench, and Eric Ebron's out there, you still gotta pick him up. Because it's just and this is going to be like negative. Because it's about um, how preseason went. Yeah, yeah, this is going to be negative because he's, of course, he's not going to get as good passes to him, but he might be the Colts' best um, receiver and option for Jacoby to throw to. So this just mm -hmm. um, might get more looks. It's, it's yeah, going to be interesting to see how the first couple weeks preseason. go. Jacoby already threw a touchdown to Eric Ebron, so I feel like that that started something beautiful. Hey, that connection is definitely going to be there, but uh, Eric Ebron's stock drops, but he's still a um, good backup to have, especially this year, because there's not a lot of tight ends. He had a good top five tight ends in the draft, but um, after that, besides, you know, Ebron was in the top five too, but... Now, mm -hmm. more than ever, you're going to have to have a good backup tight end, I think, because they're going to be really hard uh, to find. Yeah. I feel like a lot of the top five uh, tight ends this season are going to have a lot of on and off games. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So yeah. don't rely on your tight ends this season for uh, your, your main source of support. Unless you're like me, have Travis Kelsey, or if you're another lucky guy and you have Zach Ertz, because those might be the only two Pittle. reliable ones. I would say George Kittle, but oh yeah, George Kittle too. Grumpel, but um, Grumpel is a little iffy, but George Kittle is also top five. Without that, I think those are top three. Yeah, um, yeah. So with uh, Andrew Luck moving on from that, going to some other pretty big preseason news, and that involves the Wait, holdouts. Before we move on, oh, what's up? Before we move on, who'd you draft number one in your fantasy? Who would I draft number one? You know, yeah. I don't know. Let's see who you who do you draft first if you're asking. 
Uh, I didn't draft first yet. I'm probably going to still go with David Johnson. I have faith he's going to put up at least 10 points a game again this season. My draft's actually scheduled for next week. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. Um, I was able to pick up uh, Saquon with the number two overall pick, which means that yeah. um, Saquon is probably going to die this year. Because So give a little background. I'm cursed. <laughs> uh, my curse might be worse than a Madden curse. We'll see. It's only been a couple years with the curse, but we'll see. Three years ago, um, I drafted, I got number two overall pick, and I drafted David Johnson. And uh, uh. it was the first quarter of that game. He breaks his wrist, misses the entire season. Now I'm just yep. fucked. Last year, number two overall pick again, I take Le'Veon Bell. And we all know how, uh, we all know how that story went. <laughs> so, the biggest holdout. This year, I also got the number two overall pick again, and I drafted Saquon. So, um, Saquon, best of luck to you out there. It was, it's nothing personal, but um, shit, dog. I, I'd keep your head on swivel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man. Yeah, but so uh, with the holdouts now with uh, Zeke and Melvin Gordon, uh, let's go with Zeke first. Uh, so news broke earlier today. This is um, Friday, the August thirtieth, that this news broke, and um, it was from Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, and he says that he expects uh, Zeke Elliott to miss the start of the season and possibly more. Uh, he he said that it's going to be a marathon, and that they're not close right now. So, what's your take on that? Um, I feel like Jerry's making it worse. I feel like you can't keep making all these quotes and stuff about a guy you're hoping to get back, like Zeke. Who you don't you don't say stuff like that. Oh, like yeah, in, no, that that Zeke. You comment, don't expect yeah, the guy back. Like a week ago or so. Uh, yeah. So a reporter asked uh, a question to Jerry about um, Zeke. Uh, let's hold out, and I, he he said it jokingly. But um, he said, he responded with the question, Zeke who? And I get that was a joke, but I don't think it's the time for that. Yeah, especially when you're starting running back, it's expecting to get paid and coming back. Mm -hmm. And he's much of a workhorse as Zeke. You don't joke about it. No, and then it... even the first time, Zeke and his agent came out and said they did not find the joke funny. So yeah. then you come out. <laughs> A couple weeks later and say, we don't expect him back for the start of the season. He's going to go, okay, don't expect me back for any of the season. Right. It's um, That's what I said. Uh, I'm labeling this, um, along with possibly Melvin Gordon, labeling this the uh, Le'Veon effect. This is the Le'Veon effect. I uh, feel like Le'Veon. Um, I think last year he took a took a uh, play out of the playbook of NBA players who um, now more than ever have a lot more power over the league than they have before. Uh, exactly. They really are able to kind of determine their career and um, carry that on a little more than they have a lot more choice of who they play for and, um, you know, how many, if they want to stay out of the game or how much money they can demand now. And Le'Veon is bringing that to the NFL. Avon did bring that, and I guess running backs are going to just keep going by it because it's the mentality of a football player. You always have to think you're the best, so they want to get paid as the best, but mm -hmm. not everyone can be the highest paid running back in the league. Exactly. Uh, we've seen, especially over the last few years, the quarterback market has increased drastically, especially with Kirk Cousins' contract of around $90 million fully guaranteed. That um that changed the game and that's more average, of, that's going to impact the contracts, um ten years down the line at least. Yeah, no, it's it's crazy what's happening in the NFL nowadays compared to a couple years ago. Yeah, uh, the players, um, for better or for worse, it depends on your side of this. Um, if you side more with the organization or you side more with the players, I think most people would uh, side with the players, but um, it's. They get, they definitely have a lot more power and a lot more control over their career and livelihood than they ever had before. And Le'Veon yeah. is, um, he was almost a martyr for it, you know, a little sacrificial lamb 
Uh, but we'll see. Yeah, season four. We all know I how it like, out yet, though. I feel like in the long run, I feel like it'll be good for football. I feel like when players have more power, they'll be more willing to put it all out there. Yeah. Because they know they're getting what they're worth. Yep, I agree. And I feel like a lot of players nowadays hold back because they're like, "Well, I'm only going to pay ten million. I want a lot more than ten million. I'm not going to risk my body for ten million." See, I, so I feel like I like yeah. this um, change in the league. Not, not really for the the stars that are going to make a lot of money anyway. But I like this more for the players, like especially the ones that are going through days like today and tomorrow and and Sunday, who uh, the. Your careers might be effectively over. There is around 1,200 jobs that are, um, or there's around 1,200 people on NFL rosters that are not going to be not going to have a job after this weekend um, due to all the cuts uh, from the end of preseason trying to get down to that 53-man roster. And um, I think that these um, you know a little more control in your contract and your career um, probably not going to give them more control. But it's going to guarantee these lesser names a um, little more money. And yeah, I think that's only a positive for the for the league all around. Yeah, no, that's it's a big cut weekend. Yeah. By the end of this weekend, uh, both teams will be down to fifty three men. It's uh, it's, it's one of the more sad days of uh, the football season for sure because you you hate to see all these players work over the the off season and the preseason. And uh, to possibly have their dreams cut short, it's it's yeah. crazy. But I heard uh, out of Arizona, big news. Well, not really big news. More big news in a, a change of pace of how everything's been going for the past couple of preseasons. The Arizona Cardinals coach Cliff Kingsbury, Cliff Kingsbury, is actually going to be meeting personally with each person he cuts to let them know, because he said he knows how it is to be cut as a player because he was cut five or six times when he was a player. So he's trying to give them that motivation to kind of keep going and keep up with the dream and not kind of give up. Like most teams just kind of let the players go and then kind of disappear to the background. Okay, yeah. No, I like that. Uh, I wonder if that's part of maybe something that's going to become a little more common. Uh, I think that's part of what Cliff brings to the NFL is um, being mostly a college coach. Um yeah, I think I, that's that's definitely positive. That's a cool thing to see. Um, it probably it still is a big old gut punch to those players, but at least maybe it helps to sing a little less than just uh, talking with a position position coach or just having a equipment manager come over and ask you to hand in your gear. You know. Yeah, but I feel like it's also kind of gives some of those players. Like obviously, some people just aren't meant to play, so mm-hmm. those are going to get cut, and it's good to at least know that. But I feel like those players who kind of got cut and they're like, wow, I did so good. Why did I get cut? And it's kind of like they kind of just let them know, look, it's a numbers game. We have six players already here in your position that have been here before. Mm-hmm. It kind of just came down to they knew the system better than you did. Not saying they're better players than you overall. Exactly. But Today, in, the, in the place we're at right now. Yeah, this weekend's a big example of just that the NFL and football is a business. It's a huge business and very personal business but at the end of the day it's about the teams making money you know yeah so um with zeke this is a very tricky situation um i I'm, no one knows exactly how long he's going to be out he's probably going to at least miss week one and possibly even more mm-hmm. uh and i think this only is a negative impact on dak prescott yeah i feel like it's gonna make dak prescott look more human than he already is and mm-hmm. with a couple of years ago <laughs> when um, Zeke Elliott was suspended for um, six games, I believe, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, sexual harassment charges. Something like that. Man, I, I feel bad for his um, for his agent. But <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, we saw in those six games, Dak struggled, especially because their offensive line wasn't as good as the year before. It was. It's still one of the best offensive lines in the league when um, during the suspension. But it, there's a lot more pressure put on Zach to, to be able to make the throws and be able to make the reads and to even um, himself um, take off and run a little bit. And he kind of struggled. Kind of struggled. Yeah. So, yeah, too much pressure. Yeah. And he didn't know what decisions to make. So I think um, 
I think Dak's going to be the one most hurt about um, all this contract negotiations or lack thereof because yeah. um, him and Zeke together are one of the best running back, quarterback duos in the league. But with mm-hmm. Dak by itself, he turns into more of a mediocre quarterback that um, you hear most people describe him as. Yeah, he does. So we have Zeke, and then the other big-name um, running back that's holding out right now is Melvin Gordon. And so um, most recent news of Los Angeles is that there's not much progress been going on. We've seen this. We haven't seen a lot of stories or headlines or reports breaking out about this, and that's because there are none. <laughs> Chargers yeah. uh, general it's... manager Tom Telesco um, has come out and said that he does not have a solution for the contract dispute. Um, he was quoted in, a, in an interview saying, quote, I'm disappointed yeah, as I said this long. I pride myself in having solutions to problems, and I haven't solved this one yet. We know what he means to our team, and even bigger than that, what he means to our organization. But the other side is we have a big game coming up this week with the Colts, and I'm confident in the players that we have on the field right now will play well. So that's um, yeah. it's kind of damning a little bit. Uh, to Melvin Gordon, you think? Yeah, I feel like uh, they kind of just don't know what to do. And I feel like sooner or later they're just kind of give up and probably trade him or something like that. You think um, they trade him just, uh, just to be done with it? Yeah, I feel like they do. I feel like they have a good backup right now on who they have. I feel like they could finish the season out with the two running backs they have behind Melvin Gordon. Um, I feel like they think that they could finish out without him. And still do good enough to where they can draft the running back next year. I think and so. Act like it's never happened. Uh, last year, you know, they did go four zero in games without Melvin Gordon. Maybe they could um, yep. try to do that again this year. Um, but if we're talking about the trade, a team that definitely is in need right now is the Houston Texans with uh, and with the the ACL tear to um. Oh, R. Miller. Yes, to Lamar Miller, which that looked brutal. Did you watch it? Um, when it or did you see the replay of it I happening? I did not see it. I did so, not see it yet. So it up. was a it was a low tackle, but it looked like uh, the defender put his knee or his head right to the top of the kneecap, and ouch! It looked bad. <laughs> it yeah. definitely it, it did not shock me that um, the day later when they said it was torn, it did not shock me, but that's a team that is in need of a running back. Uh, and... I feel like uh, they don't really need a running back. I feel like they proven running back-wise, they do not have a proven running back. I feel like behind them, he, they still have Foreman. Foreman is a great running back in college. Mm-hmm. I feel like he did send for the cut touches he did get last season, and they also did trade for about a week or two ago. Uh, it might have been a little bit more for Duke Johnson. So they do have yes. Devontae Foreman. Duke Johnson and, from the Browns. Not Devontae. Which one is he? Yeah, uh, Devon Duke Johnson. Um, yeah, you got Dante Foreman. Duke Johnson and the um, Dante their, Foreman. The two running backs right now. But I, I think... feel like they can make with those if 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 the potential of those two running back comes out this season and they play like I believe they can. I feel like they'll be fine with the two running backs they have. Mm-hmm. But if they're talking about proven already, then no, they do not have a proven running back on their roster right no. now. No, they um they might be able to survive on those running backs. But if they really want to make a statement and capitalize on the Colts' loss of Andrew Luck and just take over that division and own it, they might want to look into a trade with Melvin Gordon. Um, we've seen that they've been shopping. Uh, another player's been holding on, Jadavian Clowney. Um, they're looking mm-hmm. around Miami. There are report, early reports of maybe a trade for um, Laramie Tunsil. But that's there's no way that happens. Uh, Lermy is way yeah, too think, important to the Dolphins. Uh, they actually, there was a uh, also reports that uh, the Texans are also offering Jadavion Clowney and a first round, in a trade that included Larry Mutunzel and a couple other things. Wow, <laughs> Javion yeah, in, in the yeah. first rounder. Like, Damn, tonight. that's yeah. That might be a worse situation than what Chargers in right now. Yeah, but uh, uh, they're. We'll I mean, they still have J.J. Watt, but I feel like Judavion Clowney kind of brings that other side oh, of totally. you can't focus on one or the other. Totally. You the, the you can have one great pass rush, and that's fine, but when you bring a duo like that together, that's that's a, that's a different beast. 
Yeah, they're going to have to change their defense up so much if they don't have somebody else who can make that impact. Exactly, but um, with that, I um, I saw a couple people uh, talking about it. I, was, I thought about it a little bit too, thinking about maybe uh, Jamie Clowney and Melvin Gordon trade, but I don't think that's necessary mm-hmm. because you still have um, Ingram and um, – you got Ingram and Bosa Both. off the edge, and there's no need for Jadavion. J- Especially um, since Jadavion wants to be the highest paid at his position right now. That's just exactly. not worth it. Uh, if, if I don't think the Chargers would want to go from dealing with one contract issue to another. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think so. It would be smart to me, but also the Chargers um, organization is not the pinnacle of smart decisions. So, not at uh, all. We'll see what dumbass Spanos uh, – Ends up doing. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, so taking a break from football real quick. Moving on to a story that came out of the MLB uh, uh, earlier this week. And that is that the Kansas City Royals um, are potentially looking to sell the team. Um, so rumor is broke after a 19-4 to drudging by the Oakland Athletics. Uh, yeah, they dragged them through the mud on that one. <laughs> Maybe mud, some nails, a little bit of broken glass in there. Some doo doo. It was um that was an ugly game <laughs> for for a, for me as A's fan. It was a whole hell of a lot of uh, fun to watch because uh, you know who doesn't love seeing nineteen runs score. <laughs> but so you know team... how you want to sell your team after that, like a thrashing. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was an actual loss. That that made them want to sell the team, but I don't know. It might push them over the edge. I doubt that though. There is probably just the the timing of when these rumors broke. But um, so the Kansas City Royals are currently listed um, to be worth around one billion dollars. Hmm. So um, going to need a pretty big uh, group of buyers to be able to take over this team. Uh, this pocket change. Yeah, I've heard <laughs> pocket change, right? We for um there's been some it, this is right now it's all just rumors um there's no actual um solid reports on the um, on the story so a lot of it's just yeah. speculation right now but there's been t- talks um the Royals are looking there so right now they have uh, a lease in their stadium through the year 2031 but they also have been voicing a little um want for a new stadium in Kansas City. But with mm. that, um, the mayor of Kansas City has said, come on, said that that's not their top of the, uh, their worries because they're more worried about them. He said trash and um, general uh, public concerns. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it's yeah, probably not going to happen, good, yeah. but the impacts of this is, so if a new team, let's speculate a little bit, let's have some fun. If a new team or a new ownership was to take over the, the Kansas City Royals, that, uh, would they move? What, because that's that's a large possibility. Yeah, I feel like they move. I feel like you don't stay in the same spot if you uh, make that a uh, big uh, time sale. Yep. If um, you're going to take over a new team like that, you kind of want to restore uh, one of the, the teams or the cities I was really thinking about for this. Um, so if they were to move, it'd probably be Montreal in Canada. Oh, okay. Yeah, because oh, that, that. that's that's a big city that um, teams are thinking about moving to. Right now, you had reports earlier this season from out of, uh, out of Tampa Bay how they might alternate between being in Tampa and being in Montreal. I think they're going to slip their home games. 50-50 is the um, story that was being talked about around that team. Yeah, I believe it was 50-50. I thought it was just, yeah, no, um, if they actually do that, that's stupid as fuck. I kind of think it takes away the, the home field advantage. Yeah, that's... If you don't have one home field. Imagine actually being that much of a dumb shit where you think it's a good idea to split up your team's uh, home games between um, one small market to another market that that could be useful, um, maybe more as an experiment to to play some games there and see how well it does. But that's it, it's it's stupid as fuck to actually actually really consider um, splitting up your home games to to half in Tampa and half in Montreal. That's not the best idea in the world, <laughs> right? 
Um, so now let's uh, transition back to a little more football. And you all know what? Uh, of course, not including the Florida, Florida Miami game that happened last week, but last night, <laughs> Thursday, August twenty ninth, was officially the return of college football, and uh, it was Big oh, it was an awesome night. Uh, of course, at this time of year, it's when you see the big teams, the big ranked teams go out and uh, play the the smaller teams. You know, and they they uh, what how it goes for some of you that don't know is that um, in football, uh, especially big time college football, the uh, the the big teams. So like, take Clemson in uh, in this example, they play Georgia Tech, and um, what they do, the, the the Clemson would pay Georgia Tech. A pretty hefty amount of money to come into uh, Clemson and pretty much just just to uh, get fucked up, lay down and get fucked. Yeah, yeah. Um, college teams <laughs> treat these first couple weeks as more of warm up games, especially you see in, in these bigger schools. They treat it as warm up games, almost exhibitions. Because of course, in college, you there is no preseason. You have uh, inner squad scrimmages, but there is no actual scrimmage against another team. So this is uh yep. t- this is a technique that they use to almost create the a first scrimmage. like live look. Yeah. Actually, uh, you know, a win doesn't hurt either. A free win doesn't hurt. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So, so um and unless you get upset like Arizona versus Hawaii. Yes. That was another thing that went down um earlier this week. You had Hawaii, I they had a receiver that went for Bird. Four touchdowns? Yeah, Bird had four receiving touchdowns. Four receiving <laughs> That's how you that's how you get the upset done. You uh have one guy score four touchdowns, motherfucker. I know, but the upset came with one yard short. Really? Khalil Tate running for the touchdown, last second, gets pulled by the last guy instead of diving into the touchdown. He tries to run it in, gets pulled and hit by two dudes, falls one yard short, loses the game, he walks off the field immediately. Wow. Almost like the the Titans and um, Dyson, you know, being half a yard short in the Super Bowl, but of course, yeah, exactly. um, I think the 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 stakes were a little little lower, you could say, in these uh, in the lower. U of A yes. and Hawaii game uh, instead of the Super Bowl. But you know, same concept. Same concept. <laughs> I mean, for Arizona, it was the high stakes because losing to a team like that pretty much almost guaranteed exactly. you're probably not back to the top twenty five. Yep, that's uh, biz Arizona. That's a Pac-12 team. That's a Big Five conference team losing to Mountain West, um, and a team that is not very good in the Mountain West either. Hey, but yeah. you know, good for Hawaii. Maybe they could uh, use this, get some momentum, make a little bit of a splash. But on a bad note for Hawaii, their starting quarterback did throw four touchdowns and four interceptions, and was then pulled from the game. Yeah, that's also something you don't want to see. You know, let's let's look at the the four touchdowns. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> maybe not the four interceptions but you know congrats to hawaii shout out to uh my former coach coach ref aguilar you know now at hawaii you know good for you guys way to get a fucking win that's beautiful yeah. so um moving on to um so last night there's um there's a few games that um there are multiple games i want i think they're like six six or eight uh but i want to look at i want to single it down to uh the three biggest games uh, that I was able to uh, see last night. Uh, first one was, of course, number one Clemson opening against Georgia Tech. Uh, Clemson won fifty-two to fourteen, and That's those um, one of the touchdowns for Georgia Tech it came in uh, garbage time. But uh, Clemson just controlled this uh, game through and through. Yeah, you know, it was not pretty. No, well, it was pretty if you're a Clemson fan. Um, yeah. If we look, Clemson's running back, uh, Travis uh, Atene, their uh, their starter, um, he started off with two. So his first two rushes of the game went for negative yards, but then his third rush went for a ninety yard touchdown down the left side of the field, and mm. that guy got to the edge and he got through that first line and it, it was a foot race and obviously no one on Georgia Tech was able to catch him. It was a really impressive run. But yeah. you know, Travis finished that game with 205 yards and three touchdowns. And yeah. I wish that I had a fantasy player that could uh, put those numbers up for me because I'd be uh, pretty damn happy with that. 
Yeah, I would too. <laughs> but one downside, to, one negative um, to this game, if you're a Clemson fan, also just looking at the quarterback race now, you know, a little, little tank for Trevor going on. Uh, quarterback Trevor Lawrence. Um, the Clemson offense, but and Trevor especially, has um, very high expectations coming off last year. Uh, he won all 11 of his starts. They blew out Alabama in the championship game. Um, so And Lawrence balled out last year. He He's definitely in the yeah, race for the though. Heisman. He was second Heisman voting, I, I believe. Somewhere up there, yeah. But he uh, finished this game 13-23 for 168 yards. He threw one touchdown and two interceptions. Yeah, um, I feel like he's going to do that again the first week against Georgia Tech. Yeah, I, I believe it's one like of the interceptions was tipped, so it wasn't totally his fault. But then um, his second interception of the night, he was rolling out of the pocket, and um, he just threw it. Uh, this was to end the half. So um, maybe put a little ass right there, but he just hucked it down the field to no one, and it was just an easy pick. So yeah, uh, I think we all sometimes have to – he was amazing last year, but maybe at the same time we gotta, you know, step back, take a breath, and realize that he was a true freshman last year. He's only a sophomore in college, and his decision making still might not be there yet. Yeah, I feel like uh, they might have opened the playbook up to him a little bit more this year, and he might be not knowing what to do a hundred percent of the time, and so uh, it kind of made him look human today. Not today, last night. Yep. Um. So you know, I'm sure this. Probably doesn't mean too much going down the line, but it might be uh, might be something to watch out for. To see if there's a little bit of a sophomore slump that you normally see in uh, in the NFL and not really in college. But who knows? Who knows? We might get one of them this year. Yep. So moving on to uh, the next game, it was number 14 Utah at BYU. Uh, Utah is able to pull off the win, 30 to 12, after going to the halftime. At only a nine to six lead, this yeah. uh, you got this game was fun, of course, because they have a giant rivalry, um, the holy war between Utah and BYU. Um, it was in BYU; they got a great crowd there, and um, it, it was a fun game, at least in the first half. But of course, in the second half, uh, Utah and their their coaches got the game plan together, and the players pulled their shit together, and they ended up. Um, they ended up kicking ass in the second half, outscoring, outscoring them um, twenty-one to three. That's impressive. I'm yeah, sorry, twenty-one to six. Twenty-one six. That's it. So it was a lot closer game than uh, than what was expected. Yeah, I was. Um, of course, you have some people saying uh, number fourteen Utah might be the quote sexy pick for um, this year's college playoffs. Uh, I don't really agree uh, with don't... that. I feel like they're in a pretty tough Pac-12. I feel like they're going to pick up a couple of league losses. I think no, if league, uh, anyone losses. makes out of that Pac-12, it's probably Washington again. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's going to be rough for Utah, um, especially the first half. They just, they did not look like a team that was going to be in the contention this year. They are playing a little sloppy. Um, their um, quarterback play wasn't very good, but um, their uh, running back, uh, yeah, had a pretty good night. Zach Moss, uh, he ended up with 29 carries for 187 yards and a touchdown. And that run game is what carried them through the game. Their quarterback um, did not throw a touchdown. And so it is really up to the run game last night. Yeah, sometimes you have to rely on different people, and that's kind of how college football is. I feel like it's you might have a bad game, so the next person has to step up. Exactly. More in college than anything. And then yeah. the uh, last game of the three that I chose – was looking at number 17, um, UCF, versus Florida A&M. And uh, you got to feel bad for Florida. They lost, uh, Florida A&M lost 62 to nothing. Now UCF put like the pounding on them. Back. <laughs> UCF back on their undefeated train. The new streak starts. <laughs> it starts with a 62 nothing win. Yeah. Uh, um, in this game, a big story to look out for was, of course, um, UCF's quarterback last year um, in their bowl game and took a gruesome hit to the knee, and it almost had to be amputated. That was a yeah. that was a scary scene out of Florida, and so of course he's not going to be playing this year. Um, but 
I, I the important thing from that situation is that he still has a leg, which is yeah, crazy to say, right? Side. Yeah, crazy to say. <laughs> but um, so the, of course, uh, the in my opinion, the player to watch was their new quarterback, Brandon Wimbush, uh, transfer from Notre Dame. He had, he had a good night. Um, you know, twelve for twenty-three, hundred sixty-eight yards, two touchdowns. That that's some respectable numbers to to start the season off. Quite they're respectable, but I feel like when you beat a team sixty-two to zero, you're not going to see your starting quarterback get high up number. Yeah, I I agree. Um, but you know, it's great to have college football back. Uh, it, yeah. a lot of people um think it's better than NFL, and in a lot of aspects, I I do have to agree. It's a lot more exciting to watch than NFL sometimes. I feel like it's more of the way football was meant to be played. Yeah. Um, of course, you have different offenses. In college is a lot more spread, a little air raid. Um, of course, from Cl- Cliff Kingsbury and most other schools uh, in the NFL, a little more ground to pound. So it, it depends on your style of football that you like, you know? Yeah. But, also, yeah. another college news that uh, just came up, I heard about yesterday, a uh, transfer from, I uh, forget what school, I think it was Coastal, uh, lineman Brock Hoffman. Uh, requested to transfer and be immediately re- reinstated so he could play at a school closer to his home. Mm. Uh, and the NCAA denied his immediate request to be reinstated so he could play football that, this season. So he's sitting out this season. Uh, he transferred so he could be closer to home because his mom's recovering from a brain tumor. And the NCAA decided to deny it based off the fact Once that again, his mom was everyone healthy home, enough. Say, just repeat after me. Fuck the NCAA. <laughs> Yeah, what I feel like that's assholes, right? For them to come out and say they denied him because they said his mom looked healthy enough. Oh my! Like, who are you to say his mom looked healthy who enough? Who the fuck says that? The NCAA is so and damn corrupt that, uh, and, and just it's it's an awful organization. It's up there with the worst governments of the world. Yeah, they they've said that uh, he he is without the he is five miles out of the hundred mile. A limit, so they had to deny him. Oh, that's so bullshit. That that is so bullshit. I I could, I could rant for for damn near a whole episode just but about how shitty and look, god awful the NCAA yeah. is. If we look at two other transfer who transferred just based off the fact that they want to play this season, mm-hmm. who did get accepted, Tate Martell for Miami mm-hmm. and uh, Fields for Ohio State, both transferred. Families don't have any medical issues that I know of. Like that, uh, like Brian uh, Brock Hoffman did, and they were both immediately given eligibility to play this season. Yeah, uh, that's that's a joke, right? Man, you you really wish that the NCAA would be able to fix your shit after a while, but no, it's 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 the same bullshit, same bullshit year in year out. Okay. Ugh. So Jalen, I want to transition real quick into a into a story that that just broke uh, while we're recording this, and that so um of course um the whole sports world was shook up um after Tyler Skaggs, an- former uh, uh, Angels starting pitcher, passed away um, July first of this year, um just out of nowhere. You remember that, right? Yeah, yeah. Big news. Um, they canceled the game for that day. Um, everyone was sh- like totally heartbroken, shook up a- about that. Um, you had the amazing response from the Angels. Um, you had that um, amazing game where the first game back in Anaheim, Biz, uh, he passed the Skaggs passed away during road trip. Their first game back in Anaheim, um, all players wore his, all players wore his number, and uh, and then they threw a combined no hitter that night, which is really really cool to see. But um, yeah. so news just broke. So for since he passed, it's just been speculation on um, the cause of his death, and no one's really known until today. So this news just broke, um, two o five Mountain Time, um, eight eight August thirtieth, and so a medical examiner in Texas has ruled that Los Angeles Angels pitcher Tyler Skaggs died from an accidental overdose. Of drugs and alcohol. Wow. They um he the autopsy found a fatal amount 
of fentanyl, oxycodone, and alcohol in system when he was found dead. Yeah. Shit, dude. It's 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 hard to, it's hard to see this happen so often nowadays. It's crazy, man. But you, you see this this young guy, uh, you know, his whole career ahead of him, and you know, you go these. Yeah, he left. It happens to left a lot of his family, lot of left behind his teammates and friends. Yeah, I feel like just a lot of young players they they get all this money and fame, and then they just don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. He was only they, twenty-seven. And, yeah, um, they go wild. So fentanyl and oxycodone, for those who don't know, are um, painkillers. Real powerful shit. And, um, yeah. of course, painkillers itself is a very touchy thing. Um, they're very easy to get addicted to. Um, yeah, I was, I was on Norco after my surgery, and I, I was only on it for about five days. But I, I could feel, already feel uh, something already starting to develop. Um, it's serious yeah. shit. Don't don't do painkillers, fuck. Yeah, stay away from it. Yeah, <laughs> stick to your CBD or whatever if that's what you're into, and especially don't combine that shit with alcohol. Cause man, do not. Those are bad, you know, separately. But shit, that that's this thing you you don't do. Yeah, uh, just stay away from drugs, kids. And on all, in all seriousness, just stay away from drugs. <laughs> Oh man! But so the um, also Skags another news that broke while we were recording. Um, Kiko Alonso requested yes. it. I saw that as well. Yeah. So um, Dolphins linebacker Kiko Alonso, um, partly famous for breaking the collarbone of uh, <laughs> of Aaron Rodgers, um, and giving Joe Flacco a concussion. That too. Yes. Yes. Very popular guy uh, around Miami. Um, he has to be traded during training camp. And so news just broke about an hour ago. And this has big implications for the Dolphins. Um, uh, because there's still... Dolphins aren't probably going to be anywhere near the playoffs this year. Um, they still have a quarterback tr- controversy between uh, their starter, their name starter for week one, um, Fitz, uh, Fitzpatrick. And then you have Josh Rosen also fine for that spot. But, yeah. Um, it's gonna, I feel like it's going to be a back-and-forth battle again. So right now, uh, looking at the, the issues um, or the uh, situations of how to resolve, um, for the Dolphins, how to resolve this issue is either they try to find a, a trade partner for uh, Kiko, or they also just might cut them by Saturday's uh, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time deadline to, uh, to set the rosters. Yeah. Um, uh, ESPN's Cameron Wolf, um, in his uh, in one of his analysis, uh, he did not include Alonzo on the, his uh, projected 53-man roster because, to him, he's not uh, Kiko is not a long-term fit with the organization. And yeah, no, um, kind of big news because Kiko Alonzo is a great talent at the linebacker position. Um, yeah, he's, he's kind of like the spirit animal of that defense. He was. He's pretty much that that Miami defense. Uh, yeah. His contract, he has uh, two years remaining, um, and those two years are worth twelve point nine million. Um, but his dead cap figure for twenty twenty is just going to be a one point seven six million. Um, he spent his last three years in Miami. Um, after seven years, he started every games, and uh, last year he uh, set a career high for himself with one hundred twenty five combined tackles. Nice. No, um, great talent. Obviously, uh, yeah, we'll see. Awesome. We'll see happens in the next few di- in the next two days. Either the Dolphins are going to trade him, or they're just going to cut him, and he's um, going to be able to look for a team that's a better fit. Because of course, as soon as he's on the market, if he is cut, um, you're going to have to you're going to have to leave trying to sign him. Obvious, <laughs> right? But um, yeah, big news. So maybe going uh, going on from the tragedy of uh, Tyler Skaggs, um, moving from that and moving from the Kiko Alonso news, let's move it into a little MMA news. We haven't talked about this yet, and uh, but yeah, fortunately, not. the way we're going to start this MMA news is with uh, another more sad note. Um, so of course, um, possibly the goat, 
Daniel Cormier, um, 15 and one in the heavyweight division. Um, he's only three. Um, he's only two losses on his record to come against John Jones and against most recently Stipe Miocic at um, UFC 241. Um, that has happened uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, when he took his first uh, loss at the heavyweight division to uh, Stipe in the fourth round, um, it's uh, TKO, right? Yeah, TKO. Yeah, TKO. But um, news broke um, yesterday, or um, a couple of days ago, that uh, his stepfather passed away from uh, cancer. And yeah, that's sad to see. Yeah. What, you got a take on this one? Yeah, um, it's it's sad, um, but I feel like a big thing that did, like a positive that did come out of it was John Jones' response. He did come out and say, uh, all beef aside, he wanted to um, kind of give us condolences for DC and his family and the loss of his father. That was nice. Um, just like a couple years ago when John Jones did lose his mom, DC came out with all beef aside and uh, gave them mothers of the backbone in the black community. And um, that he felt really sorry for John Jones lost and they were both had each other's parents and each other's thoughts. So I feel like that's kind of the thing. One of the beautiful parts of MMA is you're being the crap out of each other and you do hate some people there. But when it comes down to the, the human human side of everything, it's, it's still a huge family in the MMA community. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Shocking news. Um, well, maybe, maybe not so shocking, but it's just heartbreaking news. Um uh, DC, um, his stepdad was uh, closer to him. He DC didn't really know his um, actual father, who was murdered on a Thanksgiving when um, around when DC was uh, five years old, and so mm-hmm. uh, thoughts go out to him. Of course, um, this only puts a lot more. It, it kind of puts a lot more uh, kind of hardship on his career right now because of course he's considering retirement after his loss if, um, by Stephen Miocic. Um, he is old. He, he's um, four years old. He's in his forties, and this this decision might just uh, or this this strategy might lead to uh, his decision, probably. Yeah, DC did say though when he does decide that he'll he'll let everyone know immediately. He won't put a hold on it. It's just when he decides, he decides. Mm-hmm. So maybe, hopefully, moving from uh, from that news, let's let's take a look at. One of the most polarizing athletes in professional sports in the world, Conor McGregor. Uh. Um, he <laughs> recently had a uh, interview with Ariel Hel- um, Helwani, and Jalen, you want to take the uh, take the lead on this one? Yeah, he had an interview uh, with uh, Ariel, uh, kind of just letting him know, uh, kind of looking into what's been going on. Uh, Conor did admit that he's been kind of out of hand uh, and that his actions have been kind of threatening the future of his family. So he has been trying to calm it down as of late. Uh, there was the incident with uh, punching uh, the old guy over a whiskey dispute. Uh, that's not current. That w- that happened way earlier in the year that they already knew about. It's just okay. So that, that so that video out. broke um, last week. So um, yeah. So it just broke now out. broke out, and but it didn't happen this recently. It happened like I believe it was like uh, March or okay. something like that. It happened way earlier in the year, and this is the just the the film just came out. The video itself mm-hmm. uh, wasn't out yet, and they were just now releasing that. A lot of people uh, were, uh, already... were mad about this too, especially yeah. because recently Connor has had a little bit of running with the law. Um, earlier this year, um, he he had the the charges were um, dropped, but he broke someone's phone in um, in Miami. Then he also had a um, sexual harassment uh, allegation against him in Ireland. Of course, allegations, um, an allegation doesn't really mean much. Well, nowadays it means everything almost. But yeah, but um, it, it was just allegation at least. But then the video broke of um, him assaulting this older gentleman. And it just yeah, kind of tanked his public image. Which yeah. has already been tanked. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it was the... The video came uh, came out now, but I feel like it was during the beginning of the year when he was going through all that just craziness he was doing. So it's kind of, I mean, it's still bad to see, but at the same time, it was uh, something that happened earlier in the year, and it wasn't more recent. 
So it's kind of good to see that he's not doing anything now that's really jeopardizing anything like that. Mm -hmm. So that's good to see. Um, another couple things that came up during the uh, interview, he talked about a couple of returns that just happened, uh, more specifically Nate Diaz's return. Uh, he's publicly said that he does, doesn't mind the trilogy, but he does see why Nate Diaz might not want it. So, I mean, I feel like that was just kind of a shot he was throwing out there. Man, if that trilogy uh, just somehow like happened, that... Yeah. <laughs> um, so, of course, um, Car um, McGregor and Diaz won, and McGregor and Diaz 2 both have the highest pay-per-view sales in history for the UFC. And yeah. there's the, the third one's going to totally blow those two out of the waters if it does happen. Um, yeah. yeah <laughs> shit. Uh, the, you can't tell me that that people don't want to see that fight. Almost everyone who is knows anything about MMA wants to see that fight. Yeah, no, the first two were great fights. Love to see a third one. Uh, but it's, I feel like it's, Connor could take it, but I feel like if Connor's more focused on, he did say during the interview, he wants his belt back. That, that's his main thing, he wants his belt back. Uh, he does not mind taking another fight before having the championship fight he doesn't if he can't get he, that's big news but he also did say he, he doesn't he's not going to wait on uh, wait on habib he said he does want the habib rap rematch but he does not he's not going to wait on him to he return wants a, he, wants for little, his first. he wants a piece of that kebab so huh? he, yeah so, <laughs> uh, originally car was meant to fight in july against gaichi uh he ended up breaking his hand while still in talks you know, was um, one what time of the year these talks were happening? Uh, I believe the talks were around June, uh, and and that talks weren't around not around June. Mm -hmm. uh, the fights were planned to happen around June or July, okay. but the the talks itself were happening around the time when um, they punched the old man and stuff like that. Okay, so that was around that more time. March April talks, um, area. Yeah, somewhere around there. Uh, okay. There, uh, he ended up breaking his hand. And he also did break his foot earlier. Mm. Um, I believe that was later, la Both late these last injuries um, during training. Yeah. Okay. And then so uh, both of those happened. Connor said he's still training. He still feels good. He feels better than he's ever felt. Uh, he said he doesn't really care who he fights in his return, but he does believe his return is going to be the best return that's happened. He does say he does plan on fighting this year. Is his goal. He does plan on fighting by the end of this year. So that's what I've been seeing from a few people. Um, they're trying to get a lot of fights scheduled for um, their pay per view in December at MSG. Yeah, uh, especially on that uh, Ben Askren card with uh, versus Damian Maya. Yes, Th that, that's um, the card when that, that when that fight was announced. Yeah, I feel like that's going to be a good fight uh, if you're a fan of grappling. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a grappling fight. Ben Askren uh, um, loves... tweeted out when that happened. Um, it's going. Determined the best grapple in the world, you know. Kind of agree. I feel like it does. I feel like it, it's determining the best grappler in MMA. In I MMA. feel like it's not yes. determining the best grappler in the world because we did this just see Ben Askren got destroyed by um, Burroughs <laughs> and their uh, little exhibition that they had. Yeah, that, so that, that wrestling match. Um, yeah, um, Ben Askren had a, a few months ago, he had a wrestling match with um, top U.S. Olympian. And uh, he got fucked up pretty well. <laughs> pretty bad. He did not score a single point against him. Uh, and he lost pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, of course, you, you still don't want to diminish his wrestling ability. He's still arguably the, yeah, no, he still still might be the best wrestler best. in um, MMA. Yeah, definitely. But uh, back to Connor. Uh, Connor said he doesn't care who he fights. He said he didn't fight George Masvidal. We all do know George Masvidal will most likely be fighting Nate Diaz. He did accept Nate Diaz's uh, challenge. Uh, and they're in contracts talks at the moment. Nothing is decided as of right now. But as of right now, both fighters have agreed to the fight verbally. But uh, there's no date uh, or weight class decided yet. Most mm -hmm. likely it's going to be 70. Uh, so that'll be good to see. Uh, oh, but yeah, also, uh, Of course, that fight would be for the belt. Um, uh, no, right no. now, Nate Diaz... Um... Holds the belt for quote the best motherfucker in the on the planet. Oh uh, yeah, <laughs> they're gonna be fine for that belt. <laughs> I was about to say I don't think the welterweight belt's open like that. No, no, it's not <laughs> the welterweight belt. It's all about the best motherfucker on the planet belt. <laughs> yeah, and Jordan Masvidal has said that he wants to fight 
in uh, Nate Diaz's backyard. He wants to fight over here in California. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah uh, maybe uh, put that yeah. in another one, Anaheim or something like that. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Even bring it to bring it back to Sacramento. Stockton's not that far from Sacramento. That's a good Another point. Would uh, Sacramento be a, pr- a premier place for a big UFC? Because recently, um, over the summer, they held a fight night that featured um, that featured uh, Aspen Aspen Lad in her loss, and of course, that was uh, the return of the California Kid. You're right, a favor. And a lot of Team Alpha Male also fought in that card, which yes. is also based in Sacramento. You think Sacramento is a uh, big enough area to host a big-time like, pay-per-view? I feel like if you can get uh, if you can get your eye favor back on another card in Sacramento, get Nate Diaz to main event it, and also get a couple more Alpha Male people on that card, mm-hmm. you get Sac- Sacramento and Stockton to fill up that arena, I feel like that's, I, I feel like you get it right there. That'd be a great fucking, that'd be a great fucking card. Hell yeah. Yeah. Bring Stockton and Sacramento together for one night. Uh, that's, that's, <laughs> oh yeah. That's fire. Hey, that'd be a fun night. Uh, of course, the you know, yeah. Golden One Center is uh, one of the best arenas in the country. Um, it's only a couple years old. And it's a good venue. It's a, it's a good looking venue. Yeah, uh, still looking to expand on what they have there, so mm-hmm. that'd be a great way to get more people there. Exactly. Um, yeah, sure. but back to Connor. Connor kind of just he said he wants anybody. George, Nate, Habib. He said he'll fight Poirier. Uh, Frankie Edgar is another fire person. He said he wouldn't mind fighting, uh, and then just to get his way back to Holloway, he said he also doesn't mind doing that Holloway rematch. Uh, so. There's a lot of options, both at featherweight and lightweight, for him. Uh, he just said the main the main goal for him is to fight again this year, make his return, and to get his belt back. You know, uh, I think there's a lot of M- MMA fans that kind of are in McGregor's bad side right now. You know, he's definitely falling out of the light. But I think if one of these fights were be able to put together. Uh, that's going to put so many more eyes on that fight. There's, I doubt there's going to be anyone that's going like to be opposed to one of these fight. fights. Yeah, I feel like no matter what, if he fights, people who love him or hate him are going to watch the fight because they either want to see him knock somebody out or, or want to see him. the fuck out. <laughs> exactly. So either way, people are going to pay to see it. Exactly. Um, you know, Moving maybe on from McGregor now, on to a guy known as BJ Penn. Uh, this fight did not occur inside the octagon, but instead no, on the streets didn't. outside the bar. <laughs> Another one. This is the second time he's fought somebody at a bar. Um, yeah, and he lost. <laughs> the, the, knocked the fuck the out by that guy. Lost. Yeah, and I feel like hits too. He kind of just put his jaw out there, and the the dude put him to sleep. So you kind of hear everyone yelling in the background, "Stop! Stop!" Kind of looked like he was winning the grappling department. Uh, I know we're talking of about Of course, street I would hope here. so. I would hope he wins the grappling. And then um, stood up, and he said, hit me. I believe it was him who said, hit me. I couldn't tell exactly. The quality of the video is decent, but mm-hmm. you can't really see it. He's talking or someone else talking. Someone said, I'm pretty sure he said, hit me. Dude landed like a three-piece combo, George Masvidal style, and uh, <laughs> put him out. Or Jorge Masvidal, my apologies. Yeah, you better apologize. Yeah. He's going to be coming for you now. Yeah, exactly. He's going to open up the door <laughs> to, to a fucking flying knee. It's going to knock you the fuck out. And, yeah, five seconds. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and then, uh, yep. Yeah, big. A lot, not a lot of stories flying around right now. Um, well, it, yeah, it, and then uh, one sports. more story in uh, UFC. Not UFC. My apologies again. Bellator. Bellator. The second. Uh, we had a, a good fight. Uh, was a rematch from earlier this year, and I believe in January. Matt Mitrion versus Sergey. I can't really pronounce his last name, so I'm going to leave him at Sergey. Uh, um, um, for the viewers, uh, uh, try to pronounce his last name. Okay. Uh, Sergey. Uh, Kartnoval, Kart, Karto, Kartnov. Okay, let's leave it. Sergey Vodka. Oh. All right, let's roll with it. All right, <laughs> they fought earlier this year, and uh, it became a no contest after Matt Mitrione, uh landed. Um, I believe it was an accidental groin shot. 
and uh, Sergey could not continue, so they postponed the fight and uh, re-put it for uh, about what was that a week ago? Yep. Uh, it took it took place. And, um, um, it, it took place over. Um, Bellator has their their cards on uh, Saturdays too, I believe. And um, yeah, that was Saturday, Bellator, August twenty fourth. Yeah, and uh, Matt Mitrione had a little problem with his mouthpiece. His mouthpiece kept falling out. Uh, he, uh, he said that it was a new mouthpiece. It was molded pretty recently, and he hasn't fought with it before. At least that's a, yeah. that's what he put up on Twitter. Yeah, and so it kept falling out. The ref then warned him because uh, he thought he was spitting it out. You know, then he, he came out and said to the ref what he posted on Twitter is a new mouthpiece. Uh, and then he kept saying to his team when he went back to the corner, I have another mouthpiece in my bag. Can you get me my other mouthpiece? And his team trying to focus on the fact of, the, you know, bruising, bleeding, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They didn't make do it. And so, obviously, in a big fight, you're like, uh, your mouthpiece isn't that big of a deal. I obviously, keep it in your mouth so you don't lose any teeth. But it's not the, the biggest problem right now. Mm-hmm. So they of didn't course. work on grabbing his other mouthpiece. Uh, he then went in for, the, uh, for that fight and uh, got punched in the face again. And the mouthpiece came out. And when the ref went to go pick it up and stop the fight, Matt kind of took a step forward, not throwing a punch. And Sergey then landed a mean shot, uppercut. And yeah, it, put it was, Matt. You, if you guys are able to go uh, watch the highlights from that fight, because it was, it was, it, there is some anger behind that throw. Yeah, that was definitely a, a mean, mean throw. He fucked him up. And uh, the ref not looking, uh, picks up the mouthpiece, turns around, sees Matt Mitrion on the floor, runs in to stop it, and you can't call a no contest at that point because he didn't stop it when he went to pick up the mouthpiece. Mm-hmm. Uh, I feel like Matt kind of just assumed they both saw the mouthpiece fly out, obviously. You can kind of tell that Sergey saw the mouthpiece fly out, and then he just threw the uppercut. Yep. Matt Mitrion thought they were going to stop and wait for the mouthpiece to go back. Kind of looked like Matt was kind of stepping forward to kind of say something. I think he was probably going to step forward, kind of make a joke like, "It's fu-. I'm like I'm sorry, like mouthpiece. Yeah, I'm not doing it on purpose." And then the uppercut landed, puts him to sleep, and that that was all she wrote for that night. It was. Um, that might be the biggest storyline coming from that card, but maybe the best uh, performance might have been what happened a little earlier in the prelims. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, crazy, crazy 11 second submission, the fastest submission in Bellator history, maybe in MMA, well, UFC history also. If that was a UFC fight, I think that would be UFC history also. But uh, kind of just bell rang, kind of just sprints in there and grabs him, rolls him up, uh, puts him into a heel lock. <laughs> it, was, and, it, was, um, it was a really, um, it was a really impressive uh, performance, really impressive submission. Um, you saw some people on Twitter um, kind of show their displeasure with it because um, it looked like so. Um, so the uh, the name of the man that the fighter that was able to that won this fight via submission was Aviv Ghazali, and um, he was. It, it, um, his opponent um, kind of when you know normally uh, when it, this is in the first round so normally begin the fight yeah the fires come together touch gloves real quick and so um yeah kind of get fairly each other out <laughs> um so his opponent went it, it looked like he was going to touch gloves but then um, Aviv shot for um for a single leg then um, took him to the I ground. <laughs> um, yes, he, he it was almost like Hori, how he just ran there. He kind of did that too, but instead of going for the, the knee, he went for a little uh, single leg. Um, they they wrestled on the mat for a couple seconds, but eventually um, Ghazali was able to uh, grab that heel, and um, yeah, it was it was it was over. Th- those yeah, heel hooks and, and, and the leg hooks well, and, and the locks. Leg um, yes, but the but those submissions are some of the most painful ones in MMA. Or yeah, in, uh, when it comes to submission, the uh, submission game, you know, you you once you're in it, it's not something like a choke you might be able to fight, or some some people have been able to fight the uh, a kimura or armbar. You can't fight you can't fight uh, a heel hook. 
You fight out of a hill hook and you lose your ACL. So it's kind of not just your ACL. You're losing that that whole thing. You're losing the MCL, the meniscus. Going to be end up like Tiago Santos. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> but amazing card. Cool to see this one from Bellator. Um, of course, don't have the the best talent um, in the MMA, but they of course they still pull on great performances, and that was a fun night. Yes, that was a, it was a really good and, card. Uh, I think all um, all fights on the main card ended with the finish, which yes, it is an MMA fan. That's normally what you want to see. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, that's fighting right there. Exactly, but with that, um, that that just about wraps up. We there is a lot of news stories. In sports stories circulating um, over this last week, over the last couple weeks, and it's um, real entertaining, to say the least. Uh, we're um, when it comes to football, we're about to get into the NFL regular season. We're finally back into the college season. And baseball, we're approaching the near the end of the season. We're nearing only a month left, and that's going to be the uh, talking point of uh, next episode. If you guys want to stay tuned. For next week's um, ho- hopeful release of uh, podcast episode number three, uh, we're going to be talking a lot more baseball on that podcast. Um, so for you baseball fans out there, and even the non-baseball fans, come check it out. Because it's no matter what we talk about, it's going to be a lot of fun, right? Yeah. Jalen, thank you for joining me on our second episode. You know, fourth and long podcast yeah. episode number two. Got a lot. It has been fun. It, it was fun to be able to talk a little more about, besides just NFL, we got college, of course. We got MLB, MMA, um, UFC and Bellator news. And, uh, of course, it was another fun week um, being able to talk some shit, um, talk some sports with you. Yeah, and then being able to get some live news while we're recording, great. Oh, that's just that's the excitement. All right, everyone, <laughs> um, we're, we're going to wrap it up here. Um, I appreciate you listening into uh, this second episode of the podcast. I appreciate you, Jalen, joining me. So you can get and catch this podcast on YouTube. You can also catch um, catch this podcast on SoundCloud. Um, all of you listening, just if you want um, the news, uh, you, if um, the quickest updates about the podcast, you want to see a little sports shit talk, um, a little banter, um, be sure to follow this podcast Twitter account as at fourth long radio that's capital f o u r t h capital l o n g capital r a d i o um thank you everyone for joining us and i'll put jalen's um twitter in the description if um you guys please please go uh, follow him you know show him some love too really appreciate him uh, being able to share his knowledge of uh, football and MMA on this podcast. And, um, no problem. Any time. Yeah. We'll catch you in the next one, guys. Thank you for, uh, for listening. Have a good one.